In today's video, I'm going to take you to a lost fortress in northern Guizhou province. From the 13th to 19th century, parts of southwest China were under the control of regional chieftains. Those hereditary tribal leaders were granted imperial official positions named Tu Si. They enjoyed autonomy and also bore responsibilities to central government. The Hailong Fortress in today's video was built by the Tu Si of one of the most powerful chiefdom in China. Although only ruins of the stone walls and the gates remain, the fortress has been inscribed on the World Heritage List by UNESCO for bearing exceptional testimony to the Tu Si system. Hello, I'm Yan Yan. I'm at Hailong Fortress in Zunyi, Guizhou Province. Do you remember Diaoyu Fortress? This fortress was built in the same period as Diaoyu Fortress. It was designed by the same group of people. There was also a fierce battle happened here in the history, but it was not against the Mongols. It happened over 300 years after the siege of Diaoyu Fortress. It was totally a different story. There was a lost kingdom here, and it's a story about Tu Si. In the 14th century, there were four powerful chiefdom in Guizhou province. The populace in this region were mostly ethnic minority people. Bozhou chiefdom, the one in the north, had been ruled by the Yang clan from northern China since the 9th century, despite change of dynasties in China. Hailong Fortress is a top mountain in this region that used to be Bozhou chiefdom. This is the full view of today's hiking. The elevation difference from bottom to peak is about 400 meters. Like other travelers, I took a shuttle bus to the base of the fortress. From there, I started climbing the stone stairs. The first gate is in the elevation of 1,034 meters, about 70 meters up from bottom. Walking from the bottom of the mountain, this is the first gate you will see. But I'm not entering the gate right now because I'm going to take you guys to take a look at the wall of the fortress. This way. A boardwalk was installed outside the fortress above the steep slope of the mountain so that visitors could take a close look at the wall from outside. Below is the valley. The thick bush blocked the view of the valley and alleviated my height phobia. Now let's go back to the previous gate and see what it looks like inside. When the Mongol Empire invaded China in the 13th century, with the support from the southern Song Dynasty, the chieftain of the Yang clan built a fortress atop this mountain to resist the Mongols. In my previous video, I took you to the Diaoyu Fortress in Chongqing, which was built 14 years earlier than the Hailong Fortress for the same purpose. The designer of the Diaoyu Fortress were two brothers from Bozhou chiefdom and were referred to the Song court by the Yang clan. Two years after the construction of the Hailong Fortress, Monkey Khan of the Mongol Empire was killed in the siege of Diaoyu Fortress. Mongol troops withdrew and never came to Hailong Fortress. In less than 20 years, the Mongols overran the Song Dynasty. The Yang clan surrendered to the Mongols, and the Hailong Fortress was abandoned. I feel it's so similar to Diaoyu Fortress. Remember in Diaoyu Fortress, there is outer wall and there is interior wall up in the mountain. This is the outer wall of the Hailong Fortress. On the left is the top of the stone wall we just saw from outside. The stone wall and the gate you see here were actually built at the end of the 16th century in the Ming Dynasty. When the relation between the last two of the Yang clan and the ruling Ming court had soured, the Tusi fortified the abandoned fortress to make it a military base for the potential war between him and the Ming court. This is another gate at lower level of the mountain. 
The name of the gate is Iron Column Gate. The name of previous gate is Copper Column Gate. The two gates are connected with walls we just saw. The war between the Tu Si and Ming court finally broke out in 1599. After the Tu Si looted the neighboring states, the Ming emperor called up troops of more than 200,000 to suppress the rebellion. In 1600, the Tu Si of Bordeaux chieftain retreated to the Heilong fortress and the Ming troops laid siege of it. Recalling Diao Yu fortress, the Mongols spent four months and couldn't breach the outer wall. But during the siege of Heilong fortress, the main troops successfully broke into the outer wall. In the 13th century, the weapons that the Mongols used were troubleshoots which threw stone projectiles. 300 years later, the main troops acquired more advanced firearms. They shoot fires at the outer wall from the neighboring hills and from the slope of the mountain. The stone wall couldn't stand the attacking of firearms. Let's keep going and see what the main troops encountered after they broke into the outer wall. This section of the wall spreads on the slope of the mountain from the iron column gate all the way up. It's the eastern wall of the fortress. The horizontal wall we saw earlier and this vertical wall made a formidable enclosure in the mountain. It's really not easy to climb up this mountain, even taking the more than steps. I said more than steps because these are the original steps of the fortress, not user friendly. It's hard to imagine the main soldiers had to climb these stairs while carrying heavy weapons. Up in the hill is another gate named the Flying Tiger Gate. When the main troops arrived at this nearly vertical stairway, they couldn't advance anymore. This is the most epic sight in the fortress. They call it Heavenly Ladder or whatever it is. It's the 36th step that leads to the Flying Tiger Gate. 36 steps you think is very easy, but the Ming army was never able to bridge this gate. With me standing in front of the stairway, you should have a sense about the size of the mammoth steps. The surface of the third step is already above my head. The steps are not horizontal. Each has a slope of about 30 degrees. Visitors like to challenge themselves to climb up the steps without stopping. I was going to climb up a few steps in front of the camera, but as you've seen, it was dribbling the entire time and the stone steps became very slippery. For safety reason, I gave up this idea. Now imagine that fierce battle happened in 1600. While the Ming soldiers were running up, Tu Si's troops pushed the large stones and timbers down from the flying tiger gate above. The corpse of the Ming soldiers simply dropped to the bottom of the steps. When the site was excavated in 1970s, a lot of skeletons were found in this place. Let's continue our journey. Since I didn't dare to go from the stairway, I took the stone stairs paved for tourists bypassing the Flying Tiger Gate all the way up to another gate. This is the Flying Dragon Gate, which is where I was standing in the beginning of this video. Dragon, in Mandarin Long, is the name of the last Tu Si, Yang Ying Long. He named this gate after himself probably because of the strategic location of the gate, which is the entrance of the plateau on top of the mountain. I'll let you feel how it looks like from this gate.
Even if the main troops made it here, it wouldn't be easy for them to breach this gate. How were Flying Tiger Gate and the Flying Dragon Gate connected? This question bothered archaeologists for a long time until this path was excavated. A path was paved on the perpendicular cliff connecting the two gates. Visitors who climb up through the heavenly stairway would go through this path. Since I skipped it on my way up, I purposely made a detour on my way down to take a look. After entering the plateau through the flying dragon gate, I continued walking and saw two more gates. There are the last two of the six gates on the eastern side of the fortress. The one on the top is the Flying Phoenix Gate. There is a very romantic story behind the name. Phoenix was the name of Tu Si Yang Yinglong's favorite concubine. The Flying Phoenix Gate sees eye to eye with the Flying Dragon Gate, which is named after Tu Si himself, with the Flying Dragon Gate guarding the entrance and the Flying Phoenix Gate guarding on a high point. The plateau covers a large area. When Tu Si Yang Yinglong fortified this fortress, he made it not only a military garrison, but a self-sufficient town with a palace, administration offices, ancestral temples, etc. There are crisscross riding tracks on the plateau connecting different facilities and for soldiers to be deployed quickly. This was the location of the palace of Tu Si, but now only the foundations of the complex remain. This is the ruin of the palace of Tu Si. According to archaeologists, it had the same structure as the Forbidden City in Beijing. In June of 1600, hearing the news that Ming troops had breached the fortress, Tu Si Yang Yinglong killed his two concubines, set foul to the palace, and committed suicide inside the burning palace. But how did the Ming troops finally breach the fortress? There are three gates located at the back of the mountain, one behind another. This is the outermost one. The slope at the back is much flatter. A secret path leads to the gates which were designed for transferring food and supplies. A descender in Tu Si's camp notified the Ming commander this information. The commander instructed the troops to continue attacking the heavenly stairway to catch Tu Si's attention. Meanwhile, he led a group of troops to attack the gates at the back. On the 114th day of the siege, the fortress was breached. After the battle, a temple was built in the ruin of the palace to appease the souls of the dead. Now the vast majority of the fortress remains covered by thick bush and the surviving stone walls and the gates are in ruins, protecting still more secrets about the battle and the border triptom. According to history book, after fortification of the Heilong Fortress, Tu Si Yang Yinglong had people carve on the gate a couplet. It says, On top of Heilong Fortress, half an emperor sits above the world. His ambition was obvious, but that was not allowed in the Tu Si system. 180 years earlier, the largest chiefdom of Guizhou had already collapsed. Now, with the collapse of the Bordeaux Chiefdom, the Tusi system approached its final days. If you are interested in the Tusi system, I have a video about another Chiefdom located in western Hunan province, not far from the Bordeaux Chiefdom. It was ruled by the Peng clan for eight centuries. Their summer palace was right above a waterfall. In that video, you'll hear about stories of how the Yongshun Trifdom started and ended. In my next video of this series, I'll go to a village in Guizhou province that was evolved from a garrison of the Ming troops. 
The villagers are the descendants of the Ming soldiers and their relatives from the Yangtze River Delta region. Their dress remains the style of the Han Chinese dress in the Ming Dynasty. So is their dialect and opera. This village is an epitome of many of those villages involved from the Ming garrisons and is part of Guizhou Province's diversified cultural heritage besides minority ethnic tribes and Tusi chiefdom. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2020 commencement of Tianlong School. I'm Yan Yan. I make videos about sites of interest in China and histories and stories behind them. Subscribe to my channel. I'll see you next time in Tianlong Castle.